The following program is presented by the Metropolitan Library Service Agency. Welcome to All About Kids, a program focusing on the interests of children and young people and some of the issues affecting them. Our guest today, award-winning author of children's books, Alan Say, will be talking about his work with Ellis Navy, Youth Services Coordinator from the St. Paul Public Library. Mr. Say spent a week as artist-in-residence with the St. Paul Public Schools in the fall of 1990. Welcome to Minnesota, Alan. It's nice to have you here for Children's Book Week. Thank you. Um, El Chino was recently published by Houghton Mifflin and came out just this year in the fall of 1990. Can you tell us a little bit about how you came to write and illustrate El Chino? Yes, I first heard about El Chino uh, when he had his maiden flight in 1967. Uh, I was living in Berkeley at the time and he was considered a local boy because he had gone to the Berkeley High and then graduated from the University of California. And of course, it, uh, I was uh, extremely interested in the story because a Chinese matador, um, and um, that passed. There, in fact, there was a, a huge newspaper article uh, in the uh, San Francisco Chronicle. Then years went on. Um, I had a child, and two and a half years ago, I, I was obliged to go to a party given by one of the parents from my daughter's school. And I was speaking with a woman, uh, Janet Wong, and we were talking about um, our strange backgrounds. And she casually mentioned, well, it's like my brother-in-law, the El Chino. And I said, no, wait a minute. Are you talking about the El <laughs> the Chino? El Chino. <laughs> and uh, she said she was stunned that I had remembered. and. Um, I, I, we went on from there. I begged her to speak to her husband, and, and, and uh, I the brother my, of El Chino. Yes, uh, but this is the youngest uh, brother, Art, who is a prominent physician mm -hmm. in San Francisco today. And uh, eventually, I ended up interviewing the surviving siblings of Billy Wong. I say surviving because Billy Wong died in 1969 uh, in a car crash mm -hmm. in Mexico. And. Uh, we went from there, and I, met, I put together a dummy and submitted it to my editor at the publishing house, and I, I think he was a bit alarmed, and he said, please remember, Alan, that you're talking about a blood sport. <laughs> Bullfighting. Right. <laughs> and in fact, he and I were absolutely convinced that the book was going to bomb. But it's doing very well. Well, <laughs> surprise. Japanese life and culture seems to figure so prominently in most of, of your other works. Um, <clears throat> the Boy of the Three-Year Nap, the Caldecott Honor Book, and um, Bicycle Man. This is a true story. An another biographical, autobiographical well, story. Well, the boy uh, on the cover is me. This is, in fact, my name in Japanese on the oh, main tag. You stuck that in. <laughs> <laughs> and also, um, how My Parents Learned to Eat, of course, um, and A River Dream. Now, how is it that you are suddenly writing about Chinese, a Chinese person, and, and uh, how did you go about doing the research for um, some of the scenes in your book? Well, reflect the, Chinese I, uh, the, the, the reason that I really wanted to, to do El Chino is because I identified w with the hero. The, um, a, a man, an ethnic individual going against, going outside mm -hmm. of his heritage and doing something that uh, no Chinese had done. And at that point, of course, uh, I don't really think of myself as a Japanese. Mm -hmm. um, Asian, the popular word Asian. And so um, 
So there's a bit of, of Alan Say and Al Chino? I hope so, Al yes. Chino <laughs> and Alan Say. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to do a book that stared you in the eye. Yeah. <laughs> What is the process that, that you go through um, when you begin to create a story? Uh, where do you get your ideas? What, what's the first thing that happens? You know, m many children ask me that, Mr. Say, where do you get your ideas? And I, I usually tell them that I keep a little cockatiel in my studio <laughs> in a cage and uh, um, refuse to give him his favorite food, which is uh, purple grapes, uh, until he tells me a story. The story. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, ideas, I, I, they, they, I really don't know. I get ideas um, when I'm taking a walk or uh, suffering from insomnia. Mm -hmm. But uh, what's more important is once I do get the idea, uh, how I develop that, and it's it's uh, more s it becomes a problem solving. I create a problem and mm -hmm. I try to solve that surrounding that uh, that notion of the idea. And um, usually what happens is that I begin with a very, very rough outline as an El Chino. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what the revelation of the story was until I was halfway through with the art. That is, I, be, I started doing the illustrations first. And this is my way of solving characterization. Prior to the text, you yes. did the illustrations. Yes. I figure out how many illustrations it, it, uh, it would require that I can put into 32 pages. Mm -hmm. And um, then I just start painting them. Then as the scenes and the characters that I paint become more real to me, and somehow uh, the words happen. They come. <laughs> right. <laughs> Great. Um, when you're, you're creating an illustration, do you do research? Or how, d how does that picture come into your mind? I do a lot of re uh, I do. Uh, <coughs> good deal of research. I, of course, I draw rough composition mm -hmm. and um, figure out what I'm going to put in there. Then I go out and buy books. I used to use libraries, but it's much easier to just go out and find books <laughs> and buy them. And, you can uh, write in them. <laughs> and frequently, having been a photographer for almost 20 years, I, uh, the scenes that I would like to depict, for instance, uh, a scene in The Lost Lake, uh, on an alleyway, obviously in San Francisco somewhere, mm -hmm. I actually went out with my camera and found an alley that I liked and shot it, and I worked from that. So, um, and for the latest book that I'm working on now, um, it's called, <laughs> I'm losing my mind, <laughs> Tree of Cranes. Yes. And it's a story about my mother, and uh, I actually found a Japanese woman who was willing to pose for me, and Leave I photographed it right. And in fact, I can. Sh I brought three Great. originals, mm. and uh, you can't really see her uh, frontal view, but this this is the mother. So you found someone that looked like your mother. And you did photographs. Well, she doesn't look like my mother. No, I, I was looking for <laughs> a, a Japanese classic woman. Japanese beauty. My mother was beautiful, but not in the classic Japanese That's way. Right. So it seems then that the visual comes to you before the the, the yes, words. Yes, I'm a ponderous verbal thinker, but I think very rapidly in images. To, in images, <laughs> right. Um, some of your books you have illustrated for um, a writer, and many of them you've both written and illustrated, as um, you did for El Chino and A River Dream. Um, which do you prefer to do? Well, the reason that I was illustrating for other writers is that I, uh, the, the illustrating and writing children's books was always a uh, hobby with me. I, I spent almost 20 years in photography. I was a, an advertising, commercial photographer. Mm -hmm. And I began doing books between shooting assignments. And uh, only three years ago I decided to uh, take this up full time. And the turning point was the Boy of the Three-Year Nap. The Caldecat Honor did, Book. Which I did not write. Mm -hmm. And uh, I took this on as a sort of a, a last fling for me. That was the last children's book that I was going to do. And in the process of painting these pictures, I um, was transported back to my boyhood 
I've been my happiest time in Japan when I was uh, an apprentice to a, a one of the most famous cartoonists in post-war Japan. And that's when I decided to um, give up photography, commercial illustrating, and to do children's books. That's also when I decided to write my own material. And, not and then, of course, I'm at a time in life when I have to be very jealous of my time, sure. so I cannot be illustrating for others anymore. So. Is the process different um, when you're, you're given a text and then you do the illustrations around that? That's a very difficult question. Um, technically, uh, uh, no, uh, but it, it's, a, it's a matter of feeling, really. I, the, I do, uh, it, publishers do submit stories, uh, hoping that I would say mm -hmm. yes and illustrate them. And I'm at a point now where I really can't identify uh, with uh, the works of others, uh, the, the stories, uh, they don't really speak to me anymore, mm -hmm. and I, I must tell my own stories. But in illustrating, yes, there is a difference. Um, uh, it's a difficult uh, a point to articulate. Uh, it, illustrating my own stories, of course, they become integral part of each other. Whereas when I'm illustrating for other writers, I constantly worry about what the author might have been mm -hmm. thinking about a certain situation, mm -hmm. and uh, I simply don't want to be bothered by that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned your apprenticeship to a cartoonist. Had you always wanted to be a cartoonist? Or yes, yes. What happened a, there? <laughs> well, um, it, it's, it's <coughs> a long story. I, I hope to compress it. Um, Right after the war, I mean the Second World War. Yes. <laughs> when the war ended, I, I had just turned eight, and uh, shortly thereafter, my parents were divorced, which was a very rare thing in Japan mm -hmm. in those days. And um, when I was about 11, this was in southern uh, island of Japan, Kyushu. And when I was 11, I was sent to Tokyo to live with my uh, maternal grandmother. Mm -hmm because Tokyo is where all the schools are. And as it turned out, I say my biographical blurb that my grandmother and I took to each other like a match to gunpowder. And you were the... I was the match. The match. Yes. <laughs> um, and uh, she really didn't want to have me in her house. And she made a deal with me. Uh, that is, if I studied hard and got accepted at this very a famous prep school in Tokyo that she will get an apartment for me. And that was unheard of. Yes, yes. Yeah, uh, but I um, read up on all the cram books that I could find, and uh, much to my surprise, I had this marvelous memory. Memorized everything, and I got into the school, and my grandmother kept her part of the bargain, and I had an apartment. Actually, it was just one room, but it was a, a boy's dream come true. Sure. Uh, I could read as late as I wanted, uh, I'd draw pictures. And I was provided, once a month I would go to her house and she would uh, give me money with which I uh, ate my meals out, mm -hmm. uh, sent my clothes out for, uh, to be laundered. Then I sat down and I decided that I would become a cartoonist. And I sought out the most famous cartoonist, my favorite cartoonist and found out where his studio was. A political cartoonist? Uh, he was at one time, but mm -hmm. the, the, uh, he was best known as a, a children's... Um, his strips appeared in magazines, children's magazines, and, and I became his disciple. Mm -hmm. I was 12 years old. And uh, he not only became, became my master, but he, he became my spiritual father. Uh, I, I can only tell you this in retrospect, in hindsight. I was effectively trying to replace my father, mm -hmm. and I was very lucky. And I, as it turned out, my master was only 35 years of age at the time, and I still write to him, call him on my phone. I spoke okay. with him last week, 75 years old this year. Um, and he actually is the only person that I have consciously tried to please with my artwork. artwork. Yes. That's interesting. As, as a very successful um, 
Japanese I'm American. Not so sure. <laughs> <laughs> As a very successful Japanese American author illustrator, is there a message that you try to leave the reader with visually and through the text in your books? I really don't. Um, the I never think of messages. As I said in El Chino, working on El Chino, I didn't know what the revelation of the story was. I th I thought I was telling uh, an interesting story, and it was a discovery that I made: um, the transformation from um, Chinese was born in Nogales into a Spanish matador. Mm -hmm. But he realizes that. He's Chinese, not, mm -hmm. you know, he could never be a Spanish matador. And I was as surprised with this revelation as readers who read the book are. Anyhow, my point is that I try to tell a good story. And if there is a message, it's, it's almost a, um, it's serendipitous. Uh, perhaps you may not believe me, but I swear to you, I, I think it's the worst thing to do for an author to start out with a message. message. I have no intentions of trying to convey a, a moral lesson. Mm -hmm. um, I have no such intentions. So the story is—it's almost is like art. an aroma out of a bakery shop. I it's see. a byproduct. <laughs> um, do you have advice? I'm sure as you travel the country and talk to to would-be writers, illustrators to children. Do you have advice that you give to? <laughs> well, you, you, you're talking about art, be, be becoming artist. And uh, the best advice is to pay attention. Listen to people. Um, and the most, I keep saying that, the most important asset for an artist is his memory. Uh, for instance, my wife cannot remember uh, anything before she was 12 because her childhood was painful. Mm -hmm. Well, an artist cannot do that. He has to remember. And, and in, in fact, uh, in the, the Ink Keeper's Apprentice, my autobiography, mm -hmm. if you will, I, I speak through the mouth of my mentor, and uh, this is what he says. What we call imagination is simply a rearrangement of your memory. And if you cannot remember, then you cannot really create. So, back to the first memories one has, thinking them through and visualizing and practicing over and over? Well, it's, I, I keep ex explaining to children, I, I draw a picture of a computer head with a body attached to it. The, the mind, mind is like a computer and you feed information into it and um, you go to sleep, let's say, and wake up and there's this idea, idea or a solved problem, let's say. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a wonderful, mysterious process. I keep telling kids that a work that you do consciously, totally consciously, is usually not worth very much. <laughs> it has to be spiritual, well, too. Well, <laughs> it, it, it has to come from, um, well, the unconscious, okay, somewhere so. deeper. And uh, this is why a work of art is multi-layered. Uh, it's open to many, many interpretations. That's how I feel. Great. What kind of, what future ventures are you doing? You mentioned your uh, new book. Um, have you thought of doing photo essays? Or no, being never. A I, I will never uh, do serious photography. Well, I, I'm at a I'm, I'm at a place in life where uh, the number of books that I, I can do is quite finite. Uh, let's say 10. If I'm lucky, I hope to be able to do 10. In the rest of your life? Well, it, the rate that I'm going, uh, it takes me about a year to do a book. Mm -hmm. El Chino took me 11 months to do the art. And then, after everything was done, I sat down and wrote the text in two days. But when I did decide to uh, do this full time, this, I mean, making children's mm -hmm. books right after this. I sat down and, and wrote um, nine book ideas at one go, and I'm, and, and I'm in the process of illustrating them one after the other. 
Um, so what, what so else? So you're can I say? you're putting putting the illustrations together, and at some later point from those nine ideas, and at a later point you come up with text, which you wrap around them. Uh, yes. Well, I have the storylines in mm -hmm. mind. That is a very rough outlines. Uh, a River Dream was the first of the crop, and uh, the, wor the one I'm working on now, let me show you another Tree one. Tree of Cranes. Tree of Cranes, just two frames here. This is, this is where the boy, actually the boy is me, goes home after having done something bad, and um, he <laughs> tries to uh, avoid punishment. Did I show this already? Oh, here it is. And it's a Japanese Christmas story, actually my first Christmas story. Yep. And when will this be coming out? This will come out, uh, I, I hope this will come out next, uh, next fall. In time uh, for the 90, holidays. 91, right. Uh, that provided <coughs> that I can finish the art by the end of February. That's the deadline. But uh, I was laid up for six weeks with pinched nerve in my neck this year. I'm trying to make up for that lost time. time. How many hours goes into an illustration? For example, the one of your mother. Uh, the, the first frame, which I didn't bring because it's in Boston now, took me a month. And, and usually the first frame takes a long time because it's, it's a groping process. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm groping for style, a mood. Uh, but after I get into, uh, the, well, get into stride, uh, these on the average uh, are taking two weeks apiece. Mm -hmm. That's working every day. I have every no weekends. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned uh, some of the research you do um, when uh, illustrating. Do you go out and take photographs and let them sit a while, and then uh, do you travel around and take photographs and keep them in a store uh, no. house, for example, and then, oh, I no, think I'll I, do this? I don't have a, a stock of photographs, um, but I do collect photographs photo books, mm -hmm. uh, travel books. The next book that I'll be working on after this is called Grandfather's Journey, and it's about my grandfather at, um, journeying through America. So I'm collecting old photographs, sepia-tinted photographs mm -hmm. of uh, the United States around the turn of the century. But I don't, I, I stop carrying a camera altogether. It, it just gets in the way. When I go fishing, I don't even take a camera. <laughs> so. Wade in right, to those right. streams with no camera. Thank you so much uh, for being with us today. Um, it's been wonderful to hear the story of, of your new book, Tree of Cranes, and uh, to hear some of your comments about your new book, El Chino. Um, I hope that you'll visit Minnesota again soon. Thank you. Thank you for sharing yourself with us. Thank you very much. If ragtime music sets your toes to tapping, the story and paintings in Ragtime Tumpy by Alan Schroeder with paintings by Bernie Fuchs will do the same thing. Based on the facts of her life, this book is a fictional account of the childhood of entertainer Josephine Baker. It is truly a book of joy. Just listen. It was the summer of 1915, and St. Louis was jumping. Music was everywhere, ragtime music. As Tumpy listened outside the honky-tonk cafes, the catchy rhythm jumped to her toes and her foot began tapping out the beat on the pavement. The ragtime music reminded Tumpy of the days when her mother would take her to hear Eddie, her honky-tonk musician daddy. During those visits, Tumpy's love of music and dance grew. Eddie has since moved out, but uh, Tumpy still longed to be a famous dancer. One hot, steamy day, the medicine man came to town and announced a dancing contest. Everyone started clapping and stomping their feet, 
and when Medicine Man announced a prize of a silver dollar, Tumpy pushed her way to the stage. I ain't too little, she cried. Oh, please, mister, please let me dance. I ain't too little. Medicine Man laughed and pulled her up onto the stage. The clapping and the stomping seemed to get faster and louder. What's your name, he asked. Tumpy, she said, staring at the silver dollar. Well, you go to it, sweet pea, and he pushed her to the center of the stage. It was a fast rag, the kind her daddy used to heat up the honky-tonks with. Real jug band jazz. Tumpy closed her eyes, kicked out her legs, and pretended she was on the stage of the Booker T. Washington Theater. The crowd roared. She clapped her hands, threw her head back, and laughed and laughed. When Tumpy wins the silver dollar, she announces, I'll never stop dancing now, and she never did. Much of the charm of the book is in its design. The authentic score for the chicken chowder rag appears on the end papers, and the jacket and title page resemble sheet music covers. This book richly illustrates black life at the turn of the century and also shows how music and dance help make a life of poverty bearable. It received rave reviews everywhere. Ragtime Tumpy by Ellen Schroeder, reviewed by Lois Anderson, Children's Services Librarian at the Oxborough Community Library in Bloomington. Thank you, Ellen Say and Alice Navy, for being our guests today, and thanks to all of you for joining us. Please tune in again. This has been a presentation of Hennepin County Library in conjunction with the Twin Cities Metropolitan Library Service Agency. We thank you for watching and we hope you visit your public library often.